Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last webinar for this year. Uh, my name is Nelly, and I'll be the moderator on behalf of UNIMI prep team. Um, I'm here with Dr. Don Martin, who is a former dean of admission at the University of Chicago, at Chicago Booth, Columbia University, North Northwestern University. And we're going to talk about how to finance a grad or business school, as well how to respond to a wait list, or what happens if you get rejected. So I'm sure it will be a very interesting webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, before starting, I just want to let you know that you can ask questions anytime during the webinar, uh, just using the Q&A box, and we'll take time to answer at the end of the session. All questions are welcome, so don't hesitate. And I give the floor now to you, Don. Okay, Nelly, thank you so much, and hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this, uh, as Nelly said, the final webinar that, that I will be giving. Uh, for this year, but thankfully, and thanks to Unimi Prep and the Advent Group and Access MBA, I won't be my last webinar. I've just uh, agreed to participate in seven webinars next year. I'm very excited about this, and I know that you'll be hearing about those in the weeks ahead, so I hope you'll uh, decide to join us for some of those in the new year, but why don't we, why don't we stick with the uh, topic at hand, which is something very important, especially at this time of year. Graduate school, business school applicants are now, some, of, some business school applicants applied in the first round. Other applicants have submitted applications in September, October, November. And so starting in December and January, February, notification decisions are going to be sent out. And unfortunately, as we know, not everyone who applies to every single program gets in. This is obviously the case, and it becomes more the case the more competitive the application situation may be. So what I wanted to share with you today are some things to keep in mind should you apply to some programs either for this year or in, in the coming years, and you find out that you've either been placed on a waiting list or it was not possible to admit you. You, you receive, you are told that you, you've been denied admission for that particular year. Uh, neither of these decisions is very enjoyable. Um, so I wanna talk about that today. And of course, the all important issue of financing your graduate business school education. This is obviously something on the minds of every single prospective student, every applicant, every admitted student for that matter. So we're going, to, we're going to end talking about that. Now, before we get there, I'd like to just share a little bit with you very briefly about my background. You can obviously go to the Grad School Roadmap website. Uh, you'll, you'll get, if you see the, at the lower right-hand corner of these slides is the name Grad School Roadmap. You just type in gradschoolroadmap.com and our website will come up on your screen. But this is a little bit of background uh, from what, where I come from in terms of being involved with the graduate enrollment and student services process. I've been very fortunate in my career to have some wonderful opportunities at some amazing institutions. But I think what I'd like to share with you today more than anything is that like you, I was also a prospective graduate student twice. I did this at the master's level and then I earned a PhD. So I've been through this process twice. It was two of the best experiences of my life, honestly. I don't want to do a third one, <laughs> but two was enough. But I still, it was just an incredible, an incredible journey, a wonderful experience. So uh, I bring information to you both as a former dean of admissions for 28 years in the chair of someone evaluating graduate school applications, but also as a former prospective student myself. That's how my, my comments are going to be presented uh, to you uh, today. Again, what we're going to talk about first, what happens if you are waitlisted? What, what is it, what do, you, what, do you wanna, what do you wanna consider if that happens? What do you wanna keep in mind if you're denied? What are some things I'm gonna share about that? Then we're gonna spend time talking about financing your graduate school education. I expect my comments will take about maybe 30 minutes or so. So we're, we have an hour, we have 60 minutes for this presentation. And as 
Nellie has heard me say almost every time I've done one of these webinars, I love questions. There are no bad questions. There are no dumb questions. We're not, you know, nobody's going to find out what you asked. Uh, but I really mean this. I hope, as Nellie invited you to do, that throughout the entire presentation, if you have questions, please write them down in the chat section here on this platform so that when I conclude my remarks, Nellie has graciously agreed to be our facilitator for the Q&A. And I want to answer any questions you have, anything, uh, whether it's something we cover today or whether it's something else you'd like to know, just know that I will I'll, we'll stay on as long as we can to answer as many questions as possible. So with that in mind, let's jump right into the agenda. What happens if you are placed on a waiting list? Now, what this typically means, you're going to get a letter or a notification uh, you know, when you go onto the portal for your application at a particular institution. And they're going to say, John or Sally or whoever, uh, we are, we are, we've evaluated your application and we have decided to place you on a waiting list to review your application again at a future date. So obviously this was not what you were here wanting to hear. <laughs> obviously we all want to hear that message. You've been admitted, but not everybody can be. So what, what should you do? What happens when this occurs? I want to give you some suggestions. First of all, most importantly, this is not personal. This is not a, um, an assessment of your ability to do graduate level work at all. In fact, the fact that you were waitlisted means that there's a pretty good sense that they believe you can do graduate level work. The situation is this, as we know, let's just say that you're applying to a program that has an incoming class of 200 students. Every year they bring in to their master's or doctoral program, 200 students. Let's say their applicant pool is 1000 students. Okay, that if you do the math, you're going to realize they can't admit a thousand students or they'd be fired. <laughs> There's no way they could do that. They can only take 200, but they have an applicant pool of 1,000. So, and in some cases, this is much more. There could be an a, a, a incoming class of 200 and an applicant pool of, of 7,000 applicants. So they have to make some very difficult decisions. So it has nothing to do with their concern about your ability. If you're waitlisted, that means they're interested. It is not a personal assessment of you by any means, as difficult as it may be to hear. My second point here, as I mentioned, many waitlisted applicants, when they find out they're on the waiting list, they have this immediate reaction, <clears throat> excuse me, of feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm very close to being denied. Absolutely not true. It's the opposite. If you're on the waiting list, that means you have a very, very good chance of yet. Now, it, you wish you would have heard sooner that you got in, but there's still a chance that you will. And there's a very good chance that you will. So don't lose hope. Don't, don't be uh, upset or overly concerned. Oh, I'm going to get denied. I'm going to get denied. No, if you're on the waiting list, there's a good chance you could be admitted. Okay, be because this happens all the time. When I worked at Chicago Booth or when I worked at Columbia or Northwestern, uh, we admitted folks from the waiting list. All the, A lot of them were taken off of the waiting list. So this happened every single year of the 28 years that I was working in that capacity. My third tip for you, you can request feedback. Now, they may not always provide it. Some schools actually will say, please do not contact us. Please do not provide additional information. I think that's unfortunate. If they're going to place you on the waiting list, I think it would be nice if they would at least, we, when I worked at Booth and Columbia, if we put someone on the waiting list and they requested feedback, we gave it to them. We provided them feedback and sometimes gave them a chance to respond. Now, other times they may say to you, um, you please do not respond to us, but if you have an update 
of a work situation that you'd like to tell us about, or maybe they'll say if you'd like to send us an updated essay, if they give you an opportunity to do something, uh, you know, go ahead and do it. But if they don't provide feedback, there's not much you can do there. If they do provide feedback, the worst thing you can do is to dispute what they tell you. Maybe you don't agree with it. Maybe they say, um, we're a little concerned about your, your work background and, 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 and you might think, well, how could they be concerned about my work background? I have a very good work background. You don't argue with them. This is not the time to say, oh, I don't understand why you said that. That's not true. No, 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 no. If they give feedback, you thank them for it. Just thank them and ask them, is there anything I can do about that? Would you like me to update you? What can I do? That's the attitude you, some waitlisted candidates end up getting denied because of the way they behave when they got feedback. That causes the admissions committee to say, oh boy, this person is pretty combative. We're not gonna admit them. So if you, if you get the feedback, even if you don't agree with it, you do not argue, you accept the feedback and you act upon that feedback if they will give you the opportunity to do so. My next tip here, now here's something you can do. As I said, if there's an update, let's say you get a promotion at your job or you find out that you just got a very good GPA uh, at your, for your latest semester that you didn't have before you applied. Of course, or you, you receive a scholarship or you receive some sort of an award or you get a new job. Whatever, if there's something that has changed about your, your educational or professional background that you would like to update them about, by all means, but it should be short and to the point. You would say, uh, I, I'm currently on the waiting list. I just wanted you to know, I just received a promotion last week, effective next month. I will now be the so-and-so. And I just wanted to add this to my application. And you can always say at the end, I just wanna let you know that my interest in this program, whichever one it is, remains very high. You can tell them that by all means, let them know, but keep it short. And that's only if there's an appropriate update. You don't wanna keep responding. I just wanted to check in and let you know I'm interested. And then the next week, I just wanted to check in and let you know I'm interested. That will hurt you more than help you. So the only time you provide updates is if there's really something that's worth providing the update about, okay? Lastly, here's one thing you can do. Let's say that you applied on October the 1st and on November, 17th, you found out that you're on a waiting list and they're going to be reviewing applications again on January 10th, okay? Well, one week before January 10th, January 3rd, you can send a short email message just before that next time when they're going to review applications and just say, I want you to know I am still very excited about being part of this program. And I hope you will give me an opportunity to be admitted. There's nothing wrong with that. You can, and if, if, even if you've sent some appropriate updates before that, you can still do that, but it would be one sentence. It's not a long essay. This is a short message. I just want you to know, I, I'm so hopeful for an opportunity to join you. And by the way, if this program is your first choice, and you know that if you get in, you're going to go, you could say in that message, you could say to them, I just want you to know, if you admit me, I will enroll. You are my first choice. You can tell them that at that point. So here are some things to remember, but again, I hope you'll see which of these five points did I put in all capital letters? <laughs> The first one, it is not personal. It is never a, an, an assessment against you. It is not anything other than, this was very hard for me as a Dean of Admissions. I, I didn't want to have to place folks on the waiting list, but I didn't have a choice. I was given that the, the class size is not the decision of the Dean of Admissions. 
That's the decision of the head of the entire institution, the dean, the president, the provost. They make the call. They tell the dean of admissions, here's the number of students we want you to bring in this year. So that was following my instructions that I operated in terms of managing the applicant pool. So it meant placing folks on the waiting list. But again, point number two here, remember, you are not one step away from being denied. You are probably one step away from being admitted. So keep that in mind, okay? Now, if you have any questions about this, please make sure you're sending them to, to uh, Nelly on the chat uh, room here. I think we already have one question. That's good. Let's keep that going if you have any more. And now we're going to move to the next uh, uh, notification. And I'm going to have a drink of water here. I promise this is water in this jug. <laughs> okay. So what happens if you are denied admission? Now, I want to tell you, before I go through these things, this happened to me. I was denied the first time I applied for my doctoral program at Northwestern University. Now, what was interesting was I reapplied. Not only did they admit me the second time around, <laughs> they knocked off my whole first year of coursework. They waived it. They brought me in as a second year student. So what does that tell you? That tells you that I was a qualified applicant but there just wasn't enough room at the doctoral level, especially it's very competitive. So sometimes it doesn't always work out, but so I want you to know that I have personally been there. I have experienced how it feels when you open that email message or open that letter. And it says, unfortunately, we are not. And this was Northwestern for me. It was my first choice doctoral program. I so wanted to go. So I've been there. I know what it feels like. So what I'm telling you, I've experienced. What's my first tip? You might guess what it is because it was the first tip for what happens if you're waitlisted. Once again, this is not personal at all. It has nothing to do. It is once again, a matter of saying, all right, we can take this many applicants and we just can't take all those that apply. So there are going to be situations in fact, most applicants who are denied admission are good applicants. It has nothing to do with their, their overall quality as a candidate. It just means that in the current situation, in the current year, with the current applicant pool, that's the decision that is made. So again, in no, in no time in this entire process is there anything personal against any applicants whatsoever. I know it hurts when you're not admitted. I know that, I've experienced it, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with your ability to succeed in graduate school. So what's the next? Now, here we go. Allow yourself to be disappointed. I know I was, but what you don't wanna do is become bitter or angry or, or lose hope. You don't wanna take it out on this institution like, you know, what's wrong with you? How could you, how could you turn me down? Or, you know, and that, that's not gonna help the situation. But yes, there will be a level of disappointment and you should allow yourself. I, I for almost a week after I heard from Northwestern the first time, I was disappointed. I was so hopeful that this would work out and, and it didn't. And so I, I know how that feels, but you don't want to be bitter. You do not wanna do that. Now, here's the next thing. Do you want to try again? If you do, I have some good news for you. Nine times out of 10, doctoral and graduate school applicants are admitted the second time around. The percentage of acceptance, many prospective students are afraid that if they are denied the first time and they reapply, that they're going to be denied all over again. Absolutely not. The chances of your being admitted if you reapply go up. Why? Well, for one, maybe you got some feedback and you followed it. Two, you have another year of experience that you can talk about in your application. You have a whole nother year of work experience, educational. Maybe you've decided to take some extra coursework. 
Maybe you've retaken a standardized test. Maybe you've done something else with your professional development, whatever. Maybe you've had a study abroad or working abroad experience. There are things you're going to be able to use to update your application and perhaps make it even stronger than it was the year before. So the, the percentage of admissions for those who've been denied, who apply the second time, remember, it goes up. It doesn't go down. So that's some good news if you decide you want to try again. Next, you can request feedback. Now, uh, it's probably more likely that you're going to get feedback if you're waitlisted than if you are denied. Many institutions do not provide feedback if you are denied admission. I don't know why. We did this at the University of Chicago and Columbia. We told we tried to explain to students what happened, uh, but many institutions do not provide feedback for denied applicants at all, but it doesn't hurt to ask, especially if this program was your first choice. You can tell them, this is my first choice program. I so wanted, I want to attend. And if there's an opportunity, would it be possible for me to get some feedback on how I can improve my application? They may say, okay, yes, we will talk with you. So again, if you get the feedback, please do not argue. Do not just, just be grateful that they have provided this feedback, that they have taken the time to do this for you. So again, uh, that's your fourth tip. Final tip here, when you do reapply, if you decide you're gonna do this again, make sure you are organized and that you're focused, and most of all, that you are well ahead of deadlines, that you are really spending the time to make sure that that reapplication is, you've had enough time to prepare it, maybe send it in a day or two ahead of the deadline. You don't have to do that. You can send it in on the deadline, but if you have it ready to send in a day or two ahead of time, that just shows them all the more, okay, this, this person really was serious about this reapplication. They really and you, you make sure that this time around, you don't miss anything. You're on top of the whole process of reapplying from start to finish, okay? Once again, if there are any questions at all about this part of what happens if you are denied and what you can do, please put them into the, to the chat room uh, and we will answer them in the next probably 15 or 20 minutes. When I finish now with our third section here, which I'm sure you're very excited to hear about, as I was, and that is some financing tips. How? What are some things to keep in mind as you are preparing for your graduate school experience? I'm going to offer, there are many things I could talk about today, uh, but I'm going to offer you at least six tips. Some of these will be more applicable perhaps to those who live in the United States than they may be to those who live outside of the US, but many of them apply to both. And if you follow these, I believe you will end up with more scholarship money than you may ever have thought you might. So with that in mind, let's jump into my six financing tips right after one more drink of water, okay? Okay, here we go. Tip number one, make sure that you check your credit score before you apply. In other words, this is very, very, very important. If you have been making payments on a bill that you owe over time, you will have a credit report that lets folks know, okay, this person is pretty good about paying their bills. This credit score becomes very important when you get admitted. If you are applying for loans, they're going to check that score to see how good you are at paying back your loans. And if you have a poor report, even if it's a mistake, even if this is not correct, even if you are someone who pays your bills on time, if they get a score on you that is not good, you will automatically not qualify for loan assistance. So please make sure to check that credit score 
before you apply so that if there are any problems, you have the ability to correct them, okay? Next, you want to research institutional scholarships at the time that you are evaluating that program option. In other words, uh, you don't wait until you get admitted before you start looking at what is offered by the institution in scholarships. Many times scholarships are available to all students, whether they are from that particular country or whether they are international students. Sometimes loans are not as readily available to international students, but scholarships are. And in some cases, some institutions have their best scholarship programs that you apply for those when you apply for admission. If you don't know about that, you have lost out on an opportunity to get a scholarship if you don't know about it ahead of time. So when you're first researching that program that you're looking at, make sure you take a look at their scholarships, what they offer to their students right at the front end so that if you have any questions about that, you can ask them. So this is very, very good to do uh, in, in, when, you're, when you're preparing your applications well before you submit them. My next point, check outside resources. Perhaps in your own area where you live in your country, there could be other organizations that offer scholarship help for graduate students. In the United States, we have what we call our Department of Education, which is located in Washington, DC. This organization, the Department of Education, offers tens of millions of dollars in scholarship, free money, to graduate students every year. In some of the states in the United States, like New York, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, Texas, Florida, they offer scholarships to their individuals from their state to go to scholar to uh, go to graduate school. There are other organizations if in your home country or whatever you should check out if there are any other outside organizations that offer scholarships. They may not be as large sometimes, but every little bit adds up. So again, check outside resources for funding. Go on to the internet and plug in Fulbright Awards for graduate school, uh, international educational awards for graduate school. Check this out and make a list of, you'll probably have to apply for some of these, but there's a lot of them available. And in the United States, there are many organizations that offer scholarships for not just US citizens, but for international students as well. So make sure, again, I would suggest early on in the process that you take a look at outside resources for funding. Okay, my next point, consider working at the institution that you attend. This happens all the time. Institutions of higher education very much like to hire their students. And you can do this if you are a US citizen or if you are an international student, either way. Now, you could work, maybe you would get a job in a particular office like the admissions office or the accounting office or the development office or the student affairs office. There may be an opportunity to use your skills that you have coming in to work for maybe 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week or maybe half time. And this brings with it a tuition reimbursement usually. So if you're working 20 hours a week, let's say, maybe you'll receive half of your tuition off. Uh, I did this at both institutions. I didn't plan it ahead of time, but I worked at the institution where I was for my master's and my PhD. And my second year of my two-year master's degree, I worked full-time. My whole second year was paid for. 
uh, at Northwestern the last uh, four years of my doctoral program. I, uh, I, it took me six years to get my PhD. The last four years, I worked full time at Northwestern. Everything was paid. It ends up greatly reducing your debt, how much you owe. So make sure that you think about this. If you get admitted, one of the questions you could ask the admissions office or the financial aid office is, how do I find out about opportunities to work on campus? This could greatly help reduce the cost of your education. It certainly did for me. Okay, my next tip. Now this may seem a little strange, but let me explain what I mean. Be ready to do some, and I emphasize the word here, good faith negotiate. Good faith negotiate. Why do I say it that way? Because let's say you get admitted to three graduate programs or four, three or four or five, you get admitted and you now are trying to decide where you're going to attend and you get a financial aid package from some of these institutions. And it just so happens that the institution that is your first choice has given you the least amount of scholarship help or the least amount of, of financial aid help. What do you do? Well, here's what you can do. What you don't, you don't do this. You don't call them up and say, um, you gave me $20,000 in scholarship money and this other program gave me 40,000. Can you match that? Can you give me that too? No, that is not how, and believe me, that's done a lot. That will hurt you rather than help you. Here's what you do. Once you have your financial aid packages in front of you, you contact the person who admitted you, whatever that person's name is that was on your admissions notification. Usually it's the director of admissions. So you would reach out to them via email, or you can call them and ask to speak with them. If you've been admitted, <laughs> believe me, the director of admissions will be happy to speak with you. So you reach out to them. And when you get a chance to speak with them, what's the first thing you want to do? The first thing you want to do is say, thank you. Thank you for what? I want to thank you for admitting me. And... I would also like to thank you for the generous financial aid package you've just awarded to me. Those are the things you want to thank them for. Then you can say something like this. You never drop names. Do not give them the names of the other institutions. That looks like you're playing a game with them. You don't want to do that. But what you do want to do is say something like this. Um, I've been admitted to some other programs. They're going to expect that. If they admitted you, they're going to assume that others did too. That's not going to be a problem. And you can say, uh, I've also received some scholarship packages and um, I, some of them are a little bit larger. And I'm just one, and here's the key phrase you want to ask them. You could say, I'm wondering if you have a process that allows you to revisit financial aid awards. The answer is yes, they do. They can revisit a scholarship award and make a change. Now, if they happen to ask you, if they say, well, how much were you awarded uh, at this other school? Then if you want to tell them, you can, but you don't volunteer that information unless you're asked. But at any rate, then what you can say is, do, would you consider revisiting my award. And you could even say, and what could I do to help? Is there anything else I can provide? There is a chance that they will say, yes, we will do that. Now, and the other piece of good news here is you will never lose what you've already been given. In other words, let's say you were given $20,000. You're going to keep that no matter what happens if they review your award. They're not going to review it and then lower that initial amount. That will not happen. You will keep the $20,000 no matter what. But oftentimes, they might be willing to increase that amount. And this depends on how you present it. If you act like you're playing a game with them and that you want to, you know, I got this. Can you match that? Can you beat that? And you're, that's not going to help. But if you simply state that you did receive some other scholarship awards, some of them are larger, is there a chance they would revisit this? 
there's a far more likely chance that they will and a far more likely chance that you will receive additional funding, okay? My last tip here, our time is running by quickly. The last tip is make sure to check on scholarships after you've already enrolled. Many institutions offer scholarship help uh, during your time there. In fact, it could be that a new scholarship could come in after you've started that you would, you would qualify for beautifully. So how do you do this? Well, please don't go every week. <laughs> don't, don't go into the financial aid office every Monday. Oh, you know, I'm back to see. No, but toward the end of the term, maybe right before finals, like you're just about getting ready to finish for that term. That's when you go into the financial aid office and just ask them. Uh, I just wanted to stop by and check to see if any new scholarships have become available and if there's an application process. You always wanna let them know that you're willing to do something. You're not just asking for money, but if there's a, an application, an interview, an essay, what can you do to apply for those scholarships? Nothing wrong with doing that. If you do it maybe once a term, not over and over and over again. Ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, if you follow these steps, I promise you, you're going to end up with more money than you may have ever thought for your graduate education. It will make a difference. It works. I coach students every year. I work with probably 70, 50 to 70 students every year who are applying to graduate school. These tips work. Many of them end up with full ride scholarships or half tuition scholarships. They end up with more help than they ever thought they would by following some of these tips. They do work. So I encourage you to, to consider these when the time comes. Now, again, I hope you're writing your questions down. There's one more quick section I'm going to cover right now with you that will take all of two minutes or more. And then I'm going to turn the mic over to Nelly. We'll, be about, we'll have about 20 minutes left. We may or may not need that much time, but I I always like to allow for about 20 minutes for questions. So at any rate, I do want to provide you with a little bit of information about my, my business, Grad School Roadmap. Um, I started the company in 2008, and it, the purpose is solely to help individuals who are pursuing their graduate education to have the incredible experiences that I did. As I mentioned at the beginning of our, of our time together, my master's and PhD programs truly were two of the best experiences of my life. And my goal is to help others to have that same amazing experience. And so that's why we found you can find out a lot of what we do again by going onto the website. I will be telling you how to get onto the website shortly. In addition, we offer the only comprehensive book out there on the graduate school research and application process. And you know what? It's only 106 pages long. That's it. It's on the website. I'm gonna give you a photograph of it in just a moment. I wrote the book. The first edition was published in 2008. The second edition was, was published in 2018. We're probably gonna have a third edition in 2023. The books are selling well. So uh, keep that in mind. If It's only 106 pages long. It's not an exhaustive, a book with many, many helpful tips on both the research and the application process, both of which are critical if you're going to be successful as a graduate school applicant. Third, as I mentioned, I've worked with over 600 graduate school applicants so far up through this year. 97% of these individuals have been admitted to one or more of their top graduate school choices and we're up over $16 million US dollars in scholarships for these individuals. It has been a very, very successful collaboration with my clients. And I am taking clients. I have uh, maybe one or two spots left for those applying for fall of 2022, but I have quite a few openings now for those who will be applying for the fall of 2023. So if you're interested in that, go to the website, you can click the contact information 
and uh, I'll be happy to provide a free consultation for you. Here's a copy of the front cover or a picture of the front cover of the book, Roadmap for Graduate Study. You can order this by going to the website, there it is, or you can contact me. My email address is right here. Our website address is here and you are welcome to reach out. There's a contact box. You can click on that and send me a message right there on the website. There's all kinds of help. We have a blog section on the website that is growing every single week. It just gets better and better. So I urge you to check that out. Um, we just we add blogs usually every Monday or Tuesday. There's a variety of them on the blog section. So please check out the website. Lots of very helpful information there. Okay, uh, that does conclude my main remarks for this presentation. Thank you. It looks like everybody that joined has stayed with us throughout the, the uh, comments that I've made. And now I'm ready for the most, the fun. This is my most fun part of what I do is to turn the microphone back over to Nelly. I think we have several questions that have come in. I hope there will be more coming in. I think we have about 20 minutes left before we have to uh, say so long. Once again, one more quick thing. While this is the last webinar I'm doing this year, I'll be back thanks to Nelly and her team who've invited me to come back next year. I'm gonna be doing seven webinars, so excited. So uh, keep, tune, keep in tune for those. And uh, Nelly, thank you again. It's a pleasure working with you always. I will now turn the mic back over to you and see if we have any questions. Thank you very much, John. It was a really interesting presentation. We hear a lot of uh, things. Good. And indeed, we have um, a few questions. So allow me to start with the first one and I think uh, the most personal one. Okay, good. Um, can you share a bit more about your experience being rejected and how you stayed motiva motivated to apply again? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. And it's a very good one. Um, you know, I, I, um, it was very disappointing because I had my heart set on, I had gotten a master's degree and I, I knew I wanted to do this program. And um, after my initial disappointment, which was great, as I said, it took me a week or two. I was really, it really hurt. I am not denying that. I don't remember that I felt angry. I just was, it was like, oh, you know, I guess, you know, this isn't going to work out. It was, it was very, uh, very discouraging. Um, I did share this information with my wife uh, and I shared it with family members and not a lot, but a few close friends and they were extremely supportive. And it, they said, you know, Don, don't, don't give up. Don't give up on your dream. If this is something you really want to do, why don't you ask if you can get some feedback? And, and this is where I learned about uh, the fact that there was a greater chance of getting in if I tried again. I didn't know that. I didn't know. And that was encouraging to me. And so I, I think between the support that I felt from some of those close to me and my own inner sense that this, even though they said no, that didn't change that I really wanted to do this and that I believed that I could. And so that's what guided me and helped me to decide to try again. I will also say, uh, I'm not trying to push my coaching work on anyone, but in the, in the work that I do with my coaching clients, many of them are reapplicants. They tried the first year and it didn't work out and they decided to work with me to help them in the second year. And that can provide a source of encouragement so that when you know that there's someone working with you who knows what to do and who's actually been denied themselves, that can be very helpful as well. But I'm so glad you asked me. It's not easy when you first find out that you were denied. There's nothing I could say to myself that made it feel better. It doesn't feel good right away. But with time, that disappointment lessens and then you can refocus and say, all right, I'm going to try again. I believe I can do this and I'm going to try again. And I encourage you to do that. Anybody, if you want to do graduate school, nine times out of 10, you're going to be able to do that. If I can do it, anybody can. Excellent, excellent first question. 
Thank you very much, Don, for this uh, honest and encouraging answer. You're um, welcome. <laughs> okay, let's stay on the topic of rejection. Okay. Um, we have this question. You said that if I get rejected, I have a good chance to be admitted on the next year. What yes. if I skip one year and I apply in the year after that? Do you think I still have a good chance? All right, let me make sure I understood the question. I believe this person is asking if they would wait for two years to apply, to reapply yeah. as opposed to one, what would happen? Yeah, I think so, oh, yeah. Oh my, yes. Oh, absolutely. If you, you do not have to reapply the very next year if you don't wish to. If, if so, it could be that something may happen in your educational or career path that you would like to have an opportunity to do and then come back and try again, there is, that's absolutely fine. There is no right or wrong here uh, as to when you would reapply. Now, I will say if after, uh, at least when I worked at Columbia and the University of Chicago, if after two years, someone who had applied and did not get in, they waited beyond two years to apply again, we did not keep their other application after that. We, it was almost like they were applying again, brand new. So that's okay too, you can do that. But there's no, there's no right or wrong uh, in terms of when you would reapply. And by the way, as I answer these questions, if you still have more uh, feedback you would like, shoot me an email, please feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to communicate with you further. That was an excellent question as well. Thank you very much, Don. Um, okay, uh, we have a um, couple of questions related to the second part of your presentation about okay. scholarships. Okay. And still time for more questions, guys. So if you have any, please feel free to write us. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I apply for a scholarship, is my application going to be evaluated under more strict criteria? Oh, that's a great question. No, absolutely. Uh, the, the, oh, um, how, how do I say this? The awarding of scholarships is totally independent of the evaluation process to be admitted. They are completely separate entities entirely. There is no, financial aid is only considered after someone gets admitted. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the evaluation. I'm so glad you asked that. That's an excellent question. No, nothing. They're completely separate. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, okay, another question. Um, recently, a representative of the business school said that a student of master's degree while studying full time cannot work. Is this true? Can you work full time? Now, I'm going to assume that the person asking this question is meaning that they would be going to school full-time also, that they would be in a full, if you are in a full-time graduate program, be that an MBA or another program for that matter, the first year especially, I, I don't ever want to say it's impossible, but I think it would be extremely challenging to try to work full-time and be a full-time graduate student, especially in the first year. I think you'd have to make some trade-offs between perhaps extracurricular activities, student organizations, being more involved with your fellow students. That would probably not be able to happen. You would probably be just attending classes and then trying to do your work. And, and I, I will tell you, um, in my master's program and my PhD program, in the first year of my master's and the first two years of my PhD, I did not work uh, full time. I couldn't. It was just the workload was, I was able to keep up with the workload, but that was because I was not working. Now, in the second year of my master's program, I did work full time, but by that point, my course load had dropped a little bit. I wasn't doing as much in the course realm and the same with my PhD program. But during the full coursework, I think it could be very, 
very challenging. So I, that would be my response. That's an excellent question too. Thank you, Don. Okay, um, we have one last question and All you right. already answered this, but uh, it's an important question. I want to read it again and maybe you All can right. sum up or give us uh, your best advice. Oh, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Okay, how do you negotiate funding? Uh, you are currently admitted by a top uh, 25 school with funding and also admitted by some uh, top 20 schools with no funding. How best can you approach the negotiation? That's a great question and, and I'm, happy to, I'm happy to revisit that, no problem. What I would suggest is, so you got into a top 25 school and you got a scholarship. You got into a top 10 or 15 and you didn't. So what you want to do is you want to contact the person who admitted you to the top 10 or 15 program and let them know. Now, don't drop, as I mentioned, don't drop names. Do not start giving names. You, that, that will hurt you. But what you want to say is something like this. Um, I really thank you for it. You always, always, always start off by thanking them. For two, thank you for admitting me. I'm so thankful. And then you can say, I have also been admitted elsewhere, which again, as I said, they're not going to be surprised or offended by that. So you would say, um, I've been admitted elsewhere and uh, I have received some scholarship offers and finances are a critical part of my decision of uh, where I'm going to go to grad school. I am going to need some financial assistance. Could you help me uh, to understand if it's possible to reconsider me for a scholarship. You can absolutely do that. And by the way, whoever is asking this question, if you want to reach out to me privately and talk about this further, don't hesitate to do that. But you can always, if you do it that way, uh, I will tell you, I had an applicant for MBA, by the way, that was admitted to four institutions. And one of them was her top choice. And it was one of the top schools, but they didn't offer her any scholarship help. One of the other schools that wasn't ranked as highly had offered her a full tuition scholarship for both years. She did this very thing that I just suggested. She contacted the director of admissions where at this other school, told them what happened, asked if it was possible to reconsider. And do you know what? They matched. They gave her a full ride. She ended up getting, when initially they hadn't given her anything. So this happens. This actually does happen. So it's a, I'm, gl I'm glad you felt you could ask again. It's a good thing to, to talk about. These are excellent questions, ladies and gentlemen.